Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the February Cyberbytes Network event. My name is Joel Charlotte. I'm the Director of Operations here at the Cyberbytes Foundation, and I'm your host for today's event. I do want to let you know that we are recording this event, so if you are uncomfortable being recorded, please uh, exit the uh, webinar, and you can catch us on uh, YouTube uh, once we post the video afterwards. Today, we're bringing a great panel on the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or CMMC, uh, policy. So we've got a uh, DOD director, we've got a CMMC accreditation board member, and we've got a representative, a representative from industry on to talk about CMMC uh, and supply chain management how they're related and the importance of the policy. So first, a little bit about the Cyberbytes Foundation. So these monthly networking events are part of our outreach programs. And who are we? We're the Cyberbytes Foundation, as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit, a 501c3 based out of uh, the Quantico Cyber Hub at Stafford. So that's about 35 miles south of the Washington DC area. Our mission is really to establish and sustain a unique cyber ecosystem to produce the education, innovation, and outreach programs that are responsive to our national security challenges. And we do that with three programs. For education, we have the Cyberbytes Academy, where we're focusing on issues related to workforce development, uh, namely finding innovative and disruptive ways to close the workforce gaps. The, uh, through partnerships with other nonprofits, with government agencies, and some other companies, um, we are changing the way we educate and train the workforce. And it's not just for cybersecurity, um, but for a host of emerging uh, technology areas. So a quick plug, uh, we do run, uh, as some of the things we do uh, currently do is run some bootcamp style courses. Um, and we've got a CISSP class, for example, I believe starting next week for $999, right? So that's, uh, you're not gonna find that uh, anywhere else. So take a look at our website, check out our classes and sign up if you're interested. The second part of our mission is research. And to meet that mission, uh, we just completed construction on our state-of-the-art research center, which is home to the American Cyber League, or the ACL. The ACL is a consortium of over a thousand uh, businesses, both large and small, academic institutions, other nonprofits, and even some government agencies. The labs are designed for research and innovation of emerging technologies such as 5G, quantum, augmented and virtual reality, uh, data analytics, uh, let's see, industrial control systems, election security, uh, just to name a few. We recently announced also that we are the facility chosen to host a cooperative research and development agreement, CRADA, um, between one of our members at Corp Solutions and Marine Corps Systems Command and Marine Corps, Cyber, and, uh, Marine Corps Forces Cyber. Or Marine Corps Cyber. Uh, for outreach, we use the Quantico Cyber Hub itself. That's our building. We have over 30,000 square feet of administrative, meeting, classroom, and lab space. Um, and exciting news for those that have been following this, the cafe is open. So the cafe is now open for business. Uh, super exciting, and we couldn't be more excited about that. Um, but this building is really where we connect with and to the community. Uh, we host these monthly networking events. Um, this year, we have plans to host five summer camps. Uh, we're going to host an inaugural Quantico Cyber Cup, the CTF Challenge, um, and many more exciting community events. Um, in all, we designed the facility and the building to match its name, a hub of activity. So that's a little bit about us. Um, today, we're really here to talk about cybersecurity supply chain management. So there's really kind of so much we could be talking about here. Um, I think the solar winds hack is probably the most recent incident. And while we, I don't intend to really focus on that incident per se, uh, it could not provide a better backdrop for our conversation today. Um, so, but if, uh, and if for no other reason, that solar winds hack really highlights the need for CMMC, particularly as it relates to the supply chain, right? So with solar winds kind of being uh, everywhere. And um, my understanding is they had just integrated some third party stuff, right? So they had a supply chain. So again, not to really kind of go into the details of it, but I do want it to kind of frame the discussion today. So uh, this month, we're fortunate to have really a great panel um, that can help us walk through this topic. So I'm going to take time now to introduce our panel. Uh, first off, we have first up, we have Stacy Bastian. Uh, she's from the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense Acquisition and Sustainment uh, and the Acting Director of Supply Chain Risk Management for the Office of Undersecretary of Defense. Um, she's currently serving in, as the OUSD AS uh, Director of Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification CMC Policy. And in this role, she's responsible for managing the initiation of the CMC CMMC program and is responsible for establishing all policy and procedures with regard to CMMC. No one better to have as a, uh, and an alumni of our CDNE series as well. Uh, so welcome back, Stacy. 
Thank you. Next. You're welcome. Next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Ben Chubini. He's the uh, chair of the training committee uh, for CMMC Accreditation Body Board of Directors. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur and is currently actively involved as a guide and strategist in three organizations that he's founded. Uh, ben started work as a programmer, then as a consultant and technical training instructor for multiple U.S. Uh, military agencies and private organizations worldwide. He's authorized, uh, or excuse me, he's authored technical courses on numerous aspects of security, as well as DOD certification and accreditation process. So if you're familiar with uh, DITCAP uh, and DICAP, uh, and now their successor, uh, RMF, um, Ben will probably be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, so he's incorporated his first business in 1998 and has since uh, developed kind of a love of leadership and ethical organizational development. So we've got, you know, as you can see, some great credentials uh, to be the training committee chair. So Ben, welcome. Thank you, glad and, to be uh, here. Yeah, well, great to have you. So uh, last and certainly not least, we have uh, Chris Villasenor. He's the founder of a company called Tealspace. He has over 20 years of consulting experience in talent management, cybersecurity, and organizational effectiveness. He advises startups, uh, he, well, he ranges from startups to multinationals, uh, and really helps align human capabilities with strategy, operational improvements, and enterprise risk management. Uh, early in his career, he served as a trusted advisor to a variety of industries uh, in aligning infrastructure with emerging technologies, digitization of products and services, uh, operational improvements, and fostering an agile mindset. Uh, Chris himself is kind of right in the midst of putting together a supply chain, uh, and it will actually bring a great perspective from the industry um, from the industry side. So, Chris, thank you. All right, before before we jump into the conversation, um, I do want to let our audience know that we have muted everyone's microphones. So, if you have a question, um, please put those in the Q and A box. I'll be monitoring those, and any questions that we have, we'll answer at the end of the at the webinar. So um, the first question I kind of wanted to run through, and, and Stacey, I'll throw this out to you. Let's, let's start talking um, about CMMC in general, right? So can you just maybe give us uh, a little bit of background or um, from the uh, about the process, really, from the government's perspective on CMMC? So um, let's start at the beginning, right? So everybody was familiar with the 252, 204, 7012 clause that came into being in 2017, right? And so that said, if you handled controlled and classified information, you had to be compliant with the standard. Or if you weren't, didn't meet all the standards, you could have a COAM to get there. What we ended up finding out was that people weren't, right? That they didn't, sometimes didn't even understand what they were signing up for. So that drove uh, a reason that we needed to get out and validate that our partners in the DIB were actually compliant and handling our data in the appropriate manner. There have also been a, a lot of other things that have gone on with regard to cage codes and issues with cage codes that have also made it very poignant that each and every one of us need to take in control of our own identification, you know, our personal uh, ID information and our company ID information. I was given a speech down in South Carolina last year and a guy approached me. He lost $40,000 because somebody stole, you know, took his cage code and redirected uh, his bank account information to their bank account information. So he goes back to the government and says, hey, where's my $40,000? And, you know, you didn't pay me. And they're like, oh, yes, we did. And he was like, no. And when they finally figured it out that they had stolen his money and there's not really anybody to help him. The government didn't have another $40,000 to pay him. And, you know, you go to the Justice Department to have somebody look into it and they're like, uh, it's only $40,000. We don't have time for that. We've got bigger fish to fry, right? So it is very important that we all take this uh, very seriously and that we move forward with it. So as a result of recognizing that we needed to have a way to validate this, we also decided that we needed to make sure that we had the proper standards for companies to meet. So we got APL, Johns Hopkins APL, and Carnegie Mellon SEI, and we had them build, help build us a model, right? And so what we did was we went out to industry and we took all the best practices. If anybody watched our uh, model that we initially rolled out, the version four of it, right, or .04, there were like a ton of requirements in there. It, I, you know, we laughed. That was our Prego model because if it was was it was in there, right? And then everybody in industry kind of came back and said, "Well, 
it's a little bit heavy handed, right? And so over the next four iterations that we put out to industry, we honed it down and we worked uh, very deliberately with our industry partners to say, okay, which ones are the best ones? Which ones are the juices worth the squeeze where it doesn't put you in a position where you're spending a ton of money, but we get what we need. Because our intent is not to be overly arduous, but our intent is to raise the bar, right? So CMMC came to being because we had a, a definite need to bring uh, security and cybersecurity to the forefront of our DIB partners' minds and to make it a foundational component in anything and everything we do. You know, at one point somebody said, make it the fourth pillar of acquisition. Well, that didn't make sense because with the pillars of acquisition, you have the opportunity to negotiate one for the other and make a trade off, right? And we recognized and, and standardized on the fact that security is non negotiable. We got to have it. So that's why we ended up in that process. So where are we? Fast forward. So we got the model out, it was released last January. And we got we um, went out to industry and begged the fine individuals and fine Americans like Ben uh, here to be on the AB. And they have dedicated hundreds and thousands of hours of their personal time for free, right? Because the government's not paying them to do this. They're doing this out of the goodness of their heart to help our country put ourselves in, in a better position so we can um, stay and can maintain our superiority over our adversary. So they came into being, they've stood up, they're helping us move forward with the management of the um, CMC uh, third party assessment organizations and the training. You know, we um, wanted to ensure that there was the utmost integrity in the process and that's why we look to the ISO standards for the AB to have to meet that 17011 the um, C3 PAOs to have to meet the 17020, and then the training arm has to meet the 17024, right? To ensure that everybody's on the up, up and up and everything is kosher, and that we all have the highest level of integrity. And the mechanisms we put in place meet international standards, so they're transitional, right? Because what you're seeing, and what I'm seeing is we've got other agencies within the federal government that are extremely interested in CMMC, and interested in buying into it, right? I think they're waiting for us to do, go through our first year of implementation. And if it looks good, they're gonna be on board with us. And we've also got a lot of international uh, attention. Um, and what we're doing is we're working very closely with the International Cooperation Group to uh, work on how we would manage a, an international partner that would need to have a third party assessment. Now, what we're looking at in that vein is some international agreements and, you know, uh, looking at standards they currently have in their country and seeing where we could, we could draw some reciprocity. But that process is a little bit further down the road. Right now, we're doing our implementation pilots and we're working very closely the services of all nominated pilots that would go uh, to have CMMC because I got ahead of myself like I usually do. The, the um, Rule for CMMC, we started out as, with a normal DFAR rule and um, OMB recognized the threat to national security and the importance of CMMC. And so they allowed us to put it into an interim rule. And as an interim rule, that meant as of 30 November, we can start implementing CMMC. It can now be a uh, requirement for award in DOD contracts. Now we have a five year rollout plan. So this year we, we are going to implement it in up to 15 procurements. Next year, we intend to put it in up to 75. The next year is 250 and years four and five are about 479 acquisitions each year that would be required to have the CMMC. And then as of October 1, FY26, it's across the board in all contracts, except for contracts for the micro under the micro purchase level and COTS products. So I think I've given you what you were looking for, I hope. <laughs> yeah, and I think, uh, Stacey, first of all, thank you for that uh, great um, talk about CMMCAB. And, and, and yes, you know, I, I am a volunteer. We are volunteers right now. We are hiring staff and executive staff is taking over slowly and probably within the next, uh, actually, you know, we, we are scheduling interviews for CEO position and executive staff, like VP positions and so forth. So within the next two to three months, the AB will be um, operationally, 
you know, operated <laughs> at the staff level as opposed to director level uh, who are, uh, you know, volunteers. But the, the fact is I am uh, an immigrant and as an immigrant, I love this country because it has taken me in. I am, I am now a citizen and, you know, it, it is that freedom that I, that I love so much and cherish so much that I want to protect. And in fact, I mean, and Stacy brought up some of the reasons for CMMC. And let me tell you some of the things that I've seen out there myself in my position that are really, really scary. Like, um, I had a conversation two days ago with a, uh, an RPO who was telling me that they're talking to a contractor company that have government information that is sensitive, Right, and we'll talk about that in a second. This is the concept of CUI, which is really the driver for this. Right? The CUI, um, the the uh, disinformation, completely open, terabytes of it, terabytes of it. Right, another um, contractor company that takes this CUI, um, this this sensitive information. What does the CUI stand for? Um, controlled unclassified controlled information. unclassified information. I never remember that. I just say cooey, right? And then it just kind of, I know what it means. But controlled unclassified information, the sensitive information, right? DOD controlled unclassified information is simply just as a matter of operation, because it's really easy to do so, is being managed by Chinese employees in China. This is what they're finding out there, right? So, so this yeah. is the reason for this. Now, now, here's here's the the uh, genius of CMMC, and I want to congratulate Stacy and her team for having come up with this incredible uh, model. Uh, I'll tell you the three reasons for CM that CMMC is really the right thing. One is, you know, before, before CMMC, as Stacy alluded to, we had this this NIST standard that we went by, right, and we still go by it, which is the 800-171, which is uh, 110 controls, right, that need to be there, you know, for the DOD contract. And most co contracts will say, you know, yes, we have it, you know, and contractors will say that on their contracts and move on. But do they really, right? We don't know that. And here's the genius of CMMC. Here's number, number one. It is not one size fits all. There are five levels to CMMC. So that, you know, Lockheed can do their level five, but you know, the guy mowing the lawn at Fort Meade can do their level one. They don't need to have all of those controls in place. They only do what is necessary for them, right? So that's the thing, there's five levels. Levels one and two really don't deal with CUI, right, or CUI. They just deal with FCI, federal contract information, which is, you know, maybe not for public, but it not, not as sensitive, right? Now, the other uh, thing about, the second thing about CMMC that I believe is really genius is that security can't just be purchased that day, and here it is, it's done, right? It has not only the concept of controls, which come from 800-1000, but also processes, and, and it all has to be integrated into the organization. Security has to be integrated. So they're not called controls anymore, they're called practices, because cybersecurity is an integral, is, is required, is asked that it be an integral part of every business, right? That not only does the IT guy have to worry about it and the cybersecurity guy, but also the CFO, because they have to budget for it. Also governance, because they have to write policies for it. Also marketing and, and contracts, because if it's not there, they're not gonna get their contract, right? So it becomes engulfed into the life cycle processes for the business. That's the second thing about CMMC, which is amazing. It's incredible. That's what really is it. So here's the third thing. We're going to come check, right? It's going to actually be assessed. There's going to be someone who shows up at your doorstep and who's going to make sure that this is the case, right? As opposed to the other stuff, which is, oh, you know, we'll, we'll do a self uh, affirmation that we are okay. And then everyone is going to believe it and we're cool. And that's where, when the, the governance organizations don't worry about it anymore. Right. And so I think, uh, again, thank you, Stacy, for this amazing, amazing thing, you and your staff and your contractors, you know, I'm doing my part as a citizen, but I think it's really important to, to say how amazing CMMC is and how much it's going to help safeguard our nation. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe just I can add to that because I think uh, Ben and Stacey bring up good points. I, I think not just uh, federal, but also the private sector is thirsty for a framework that we can all get behind. 
this is a big lift that you guys are uh, uh, carrying out. I'm on the AB website, I think, every day for updates, Ben. Um, you know, right now I'm working with some of the provisional assessors. I'm working with um, publishers, the LPPs. Teal Space will be an LTP, will be carrying training. And really what we're talking about is creating a new cyber workforce to carry on this mission. Um, so, you know, we're exploring areas like um, getting people out of the military that have clearances, that can fast track into this arena. We're talking about um, how, how does this type of mission appeal to Marineers, the next generation of workforce. But I think what we're um, keen to see is uh, what, what Ben was speaking to is now we can actually speak with some continuity across uh, what, what, is, what is good security, what is a good posture to have. And I think what we're going to see over time is conformity. We're going to be able to say that on certain contracts, certain bids, we know that these, uh, these primes have a conformity metric where we can ensure a certain um, uh, uh, security. And I think what that ultimately does is increase efficiency in our workforce in terms of carrying on the mission and programs for the government. So this is, um, this is a revolutionary change. It's probably overdue. Um, my, my work has predominantly been in the human factors and cyber threat side of this. And, uh, you know, I'm used to kind of referencing executive order 13587. You, you got to have an insider threat program. But now we actually know what that means. It's defined. If you want to take it to the next level, then you have clear gauges and barometers to get there. And so I think we're going to see this be a catalyst to really improving um, our entire security, especially across networks. Yeah, and, and this is a great conversation. Um, I, I love, you know, I mean, I, I agree. I think uh, I, you're all bringing up some really, really good points. Um, and, you know, uh, from a personal sort of uh, selfish um, perspective, I appreciate that you guys can carry on the conversation without me having to ask you a question. So that is awesome. Uh, I do love that. But um, so let me let me kind of pivot a little bit, maybe. Um, let's talk about really more about the like the supply chain, for example, right? Because I think one piece that that um, you know we might have mentioned or maybe uh, needs a little bit more attention is really the supply chain aspect of this, right? Because CMMC is not just about the individual company who's contracting with the federal government. It's about that company and their subcontractors, right? Because to date, there hasn't been a mechanism for the primes to be able to sort of um, hold the subcontractors to a standard, if you will. Uh, and and I'm may, I might be saying that wrong, but the intent there is right. right we want to be able to include, you know, a bit, DOD has a supply chain, but a contractor, a prime contractor, has a supply chain as well, and they both need to be protected. So, so with that, I mean, and, and as we talk about the supply chain, I mean, are there any specific? You know, failures or lessons learned um, that really led to the creation of CMMC. Um, I mean, I know we talked, Stacey, you talked a little bit about just sort of the overall, but I mean, can you think of anything, maybe a, a great little story here that, that could be a, you know, a good conversation about why we actually got here? And Wait, Solar so, Winds, by the way, is fair game. So, Solar Winds just happened, right? And with our, uh, and the first thing we did is we went back and looked and said, how would our model match up with that threat that we saw? And the one thing I will tell you is this is going to be something that we're, we are going to do with the model going forward, right? Is, is as we learn of different potential threats, as we learn of uh, actual threats, we're going to be looking at the model to see how they would have stacked up against something like this, right? Now, in solar ones, you had a uh, advanced state actor that we, you know, we have discovered that was behind this. So when we, we took the model, we laid it up against it. You know, what we said was, if you were fully compliant with MMC level three, you would have been able to see indicators that of what was going on. It would not have stopped the action, but you would have been aware. Mm -hmm. And so you could have reacted quickly and, and shut down the, um, the hack fast. Um, when it came to, to levels four and five, there are more things in levels four and five that would have been in position to have stopped that, that from happening. There are several thousands probably of different uh, instances where we have seen our data be expelled across uh, to our adversaries, right? Where if we had had a CMMC type thing, it would have stopped. There was one poor company I'm not going to mention the name, right? But they got they 
didn't realize they ever got hacked for the first time until the FBI knocked on the door and said, um, hello, excuse me, uh, you had a hack, right? And so they told them what they were doing and they started looking at it. And while they were looking at it, they got hacked again. So they called in a company like FireEye to help them. And while FireEye was in their spaces trying to help fix their problem, they got hacked again. Okay, so this company was uh, definitely had data and information and they were not the prime. They were a subcontractor. And what we find is oftentimes our, our um, adversaries are laying in wait in our subcontractors. And they're, it's low, you know, it's a slow under the radar scraping of information and there, and that's why there's a plane that looks just like our F-35 over in uh, uh, China, right? I think it's the J-31 or it's the F-31. And, you know, the scary part of it is they copied it all the way down to the flaw that we have in our canopy, right? We have a flaw in our canopy. It was part of a design flaw. And guess what? They got the exact same one because they didn't even think through anything themselves. They just took our data and remade it. Right. And so now my son, who's of military age, right? So if he had to go to war, he's not going to have the military in the advantage any longer because he's going to go ahead nose to nose with an airplane that's just the same capabilities as ours. You know, and the other side of it is we've seen this time and again. There have been uh, articles in the Washington Post about data that was lost from various different things where we and more and more we're finding out about how our data was taken and with quantum coming in and 5g we're going to lose it's going to be going out the door way faster right and we're not going to be able to get on top of it after the fact we need to be out in front of it and that's why cmmc needs to be in place to to at least fortify ourselves somewhat Right, and we laugh because the true computer geeks, and I'm probably gonna say I'm speaking more to them today than some other times that I speak. A lot of them look at the model and they're like, y'all are being wimpy. It's not that hard what you're asking people to do. But then you have the others on the other side going, oh my God, you're killing me. We're gonna go out of business. It's so hard on me. So I laugh because I say, we must be in the sweet spot. We must be doing something right because I got people complaining on both sides of the house, right? And so, we, you know, the whole intent of CMMC is to get people thinking about the potential threat of the fact that, you know, I mean, so many people, I tell the story, it, probably people have heard it so many times, so they're like, I, I can say it for you, Stacy. you don't even have to say it, right, was the, the story about the, the welder out at Transcom, who was like, I'm a welder, what do I need cybersecurity for, right? And then he ends up with the entire structural design of, a, of one of our tactical aircraft. And those are the type of people they go after, right? Because they're like our program managers and um, I'm starting to get on my soapbox. You guys are going to grab me down. Our prime contractors and our PMs are not being intentional about the data that they flow down and where they flow it, right? We've been lazy because we've been short on time. It's the new world. Hey, I'm just going to take that whole tech data package or the whole structural design of that aircraft. I'm going to send them to the water. He can figure out what parts he needs to look at. As opposed to the fact, have we gone in, cut out his specific welds and sent him that, then maybe he wouldn't have to be CMMC level three. Maybe that wouldn't rise to the level of CUI, right? So one of the things that's very important that we are doing in the um, Department of Defense is we're going through putting together training program so our program managers definitively understand how to look at their program, how to break it down to be able to assign that CUI level at the different levels of data that they would have to send. So we can be intentional about the data that we send down our, our supply chain, right? Because it doesn't make sense for our supply chain to have to be CMMC level three when I'm just the bolt manufacturer, right? So if we can pare down the information that we send the bolt manufacturer, like we just need a bolt that's like this and not the whole tech data package, then we spare him from that need, right? And we protect ourselves from losing our crown jewels. And I was, I I was just, so you, you, <laughs> you, you stole my thunder because I was talking about, but I was going to say nails and screws, but bolts are just as well, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's why is it? 
that when you have a metal manufacturer building, you know, let's stick with bolts, has the entire designs, like all of the entire designs. They don't need that. And, you know, uh, I love the, the, what you, you started with, uh, Joel, which is, you know, how is this going to affect the supply chain? You know, if everybody, if all of the subcontractors of Lockheed, for example, you know, and that's a lot of subcontractors, right? Mm -hmm. And and those subcontractors have subcontractors. And those subcontractors have subcontractors. So, it, you know, it just goes, you know, it's a huge tree, right? If all of them have to be um, at the highest level, then that's going to make it much more expensive for Lockheed to manage their contract, right? And they may lose a contract. So this is, you know, what security in the world of IT, and I love how you said it, you know, it's a little bit too late for CMMC, but here we are, right? But in a world run by computers, I mean, if, if a computer failed right now, not only would we not be able to speak to each other, but we wouldn't be able to do much else if we didn't have computers right now, right? So in a world led by computers and run by computers and data and information, uh, you know, I feel like cybersecurity has to be like death and taxes, right? Can't avoid it. You have to have it. And so as a result, what the prime contractors are going to be driven to do with CMMC is to define the data that's flowing down, just like Stacy said. Because if they give all of the data to their subcontractors, now all their subcontractors have to be at a higher level, which means it's more expensive, which means it's going to increase the price on the prime contractor of running the contract. So it drives, in fact, efficiency in the transfer of information which then, and, and I love, again, the, the genius of this thing, I love it, because what it allows this to do is then the subcontractors can be at lower levels of cybersecurity, at lower levels of CMMC, which will not drive the cost as high for the primes, which will then increase security. You know, when you bring, it, when you bring in the money, that's when, you know, money talks and the rest walks, right? And so, you know, it, it's, that's what this is doing is to make our prime contractors and the subs, which have subs, think about what data they're sharing with their partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Joe, let me just piggyback on that a little bit. I mean, I think this is a, this is a, a really a, a few things to consider. We're, we're, we're basically moving away from a system that has been built on trust that's being now built on verification, right? We believe that um, that's going to require a high degree of specialism because now you can't be a, a jack of all and a master of nothing. So smaller primes are going to have to somewhat, um, uh, subs are going to have to start focusing on where they're going to play and make sure they have that right level of security. Um, so uh, a little bit deeper, or maybe not as, as wide. I think the other thing that we're looking at is um, CMMMC is going to provide another level of due diligence, not just in uh, acquisitions, but also in partnering. So this will be another way of vetting your partners, screening them, looking at um, companies to acquire. Those that have a certain level will be more valuable in this upcoming market. So, you know, that conformity and that consistency uh, provides a lot of value and opportunity. You know, as this rolls out, I think smaller um, providers in the space, um, uh, smaller subs are going to have to, you know, find their, their sweet spot, those partnerships. It's going to put a higher demand on that. Um, so that's something I'd be uh, curious to see how that plays out as this goes on. And it just doesn't get gobbled up by the big contractors, uh, this opportunity we see. Uh, and then the other thing I would say in, in closing is that um, this is a leadership issue, right? So. Um, I think uh, Stacy and, and Ben said it well, you know, this is going to get into the boardroom. These conversations have to be happening mm -hmm. and making the appropriate investments. And I can't tell you how many sisters I talk to that have to do all these things, but don't ever have the, um, uh, the, uh, the resources to, to do so. So I think we're going to see a real different conversation, a massive investment in the space um, that's going to actually um, be a catalyst to getting further faster with our security in this country. So the one thing I want to bring up about tag on to you, you know, you to start talking about the money, you're right? It's definitely a C-suite discussion, right? The CEO and the leadership of each com company has to be involved and they have to be behind this. Number one. Number two, a lot of people have a lot of consternation about the cost of this and how they're going to cover it. And the one thing that you that we need to make sure people understand is, is that you can recoup 
the costs from CMMC level one up to CMMC level three are an allowable cost that can be recouped under your overhead and GNA. So you can up, it's an allowable cost that you can pass on to your government uh, contracts through overhead and GNA rate. So it's gonna be spread out over a period of time. When you start looking at the CMMC level fours and fives, that capability is so specific and gonna be so unique and it's gonna be such a small portion of our contractor base that's gonna to have to rise to that level that they will be directly to the contract, but they'll be responsible to their on their own dime and recouping it through their overhead and GNA rates and four and five will most probably be a um, direct charge to the contract that's gonna be requiring that. I want to make sure we got that because we started talking about money and costs, and I know that's going to be a question that's going to be coming in. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys are doing a great job of kind of anticipating all of my questions. Um, so, um, but I know, you know, Stacy, to your point, the money question is always there, right? Like, and we feel, you know, because of our mission being in cybersecurity, um, and then you know our role uh, kind of a little early on and kind of helping support CMMC, we do get a lot of questions. Um, and that's always one of them is, well, how, how am I supposed to pay for this? Right? So I appreciate you answering that question, um, you know, without me having to ask it. Uh, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, I kind of want to, I want to go off, like, I know we, we had prepped a little bit ahead of time, but I want to, Stacey, you brought something up that I kind of want to circle back on. Um, and really this will be kind of, maybe it might even be for Ben um, and or for Chris, but, you know, we talked to, you, you had mentioned that, you know, solar winds had just happened. And then you took the threat that ha that that we saw in solar winds, and you compared it to, or you you took it and you compared it with the model and how it would have helped or not helped, and maybe what holes. So, what's the feedback mechanism then when something like that happens into the model, right? So, is it through training? Is it like what's is it a is that the CMMC AB's role to do that, or is that DOD's, or is it? someone like Chris's role to kind of keep up on that. How, how's that going to, how's that going to play? Okay. So uh, I'm sure Stacy is going to speak to this from the DOD's perspective, from our perspective, but um, we are building an infrastructure and Chris said he's on our website uh, every day. Not much changes on a daily basis. So I apologize for that, but there is a lot coming. Um, so, so the, you know, the, one of the things that we're working on is the body of knowledge, the, the CMMC box. And what that is, is going to be a repository of lessons learned, right? And the ecosystem stakeholders are going to come in, they're going to talk about what's been happening and so forth. And that's going to be feeding into the AB's, you know, uh, re data repository, right? Where we will then take all of this and, and take, you know, a, a summarized version perhaps and, and send it out to the DOD. You know, the, these are the lessons learned from the industry. These are the, the conversations people are having. Right now it's off of LinkedIn. <laughs> so we wanna make it a little bit more structured, right? And, and, and have really an avenue because the world is changing all the time, right? And, mm -hmm. and, um, and the, only, the only thing that doesn't change or something like that, right? The only thing that doesn't change is change or something like that. Um, so, so what, what that is, 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 is going to be a way to capture the world as it, as it changes and the lessons learned and then move it over to the DOD. The mission, the, the model does belong to the DOD and of course they have their own mechanisms as well, which I'll, I'll let Stacy talk. Well, that's exactly what I was going to jump in with, um, with you right there is so the DOD does own the model and we are responsible for maintaining that now. As with solar winds, you know, as soon as that hit, everybody's like, wait, CMMC cover that. What, you know, what parts of CMMC? And so what we will do is as threats are identified, we will evaluate against our model, say, okay, what were the good things the model could do? What are the bad things? Where, where were their gaps? So undoubtedly our, our model is not gonna stay static. Right? We anticipate that it will at a minimum be updated annually. And if there is a huge major threat that comes out that we need to turn to, we will, we will probably update it more frequently. Now, every time we change that model, we have to go out for public comment. That's part of the rulemaking uh, rules that we have to abide by. 
So that un will slow down our ability to turn to on some of these things. We may have to put it out as an interim guidance and then follow up with uh, public comment to be able to, to hit uh, an attack you know, sooner rather than later, depending on the national security uh, threat. And then as other federal agencies come on board, because I've had a lot of questions with regard to that. The DOD's position right now is we would like the other agencies to come up underneath DOD, let DOD maintain the executive agency for the CMMC model. So we have a single model standard that everybody in the, in the federal government uh, industrial base would follow, because I think we will drive contractors crazy if DOD has one standard, DHS has a standard, and each one has their own C3 PAOs that, that assess to whatever they like, I think it would be too onerous on our industrial base to do that. And with that said, if we have a um, multitude of, company, of agencies under the federal government coming in under the CMMC umbrella, a board will be established very much like they have with GSA FedRAMP. So that when we make these changes, they're discussed across the entire scope. So all the CISOs would be involved. The CIO IT folks would be involved in making that decision to make those changes to the model. So, and Chris, we, we need to hear from you now because I've been. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, the, it, well, why it's in the news all so much is because um, the reality is these breaches and these hacks are happening all the time in the private sector. They're kind of covered up. I think the real concern from industry is because solar solar winds in particular was uh, deemed to be state of the art um, ISO SOC compliant. So it's not that somebody you know fell asleep at the wheel, but the sense of it was that this was a trusted supplier in the supply chain, um, and, and therefore uh, the, the the spread of this uh, attack and it, uh, it appears to be on a nation state level is so concerning. And I think the real lesson here is that we have to stay vigilant. I, I don't think that um, this new framework is going to come into place and be a silver bullet either. It's going to take time. It's going to adapt. It's going to be a lot of learning. And so I think what we what we need to understand is that potentially identifying um, these risks earlier is, is a real lesson. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, this uh, SolarWinds acquired a company where this um, this this attack came from, and I actually believe it was foreign owned. And so what we're, what, we're, what we're really talking about is more of a 360 view of that supply chain, right? So it's not just acquiring for technology, it's actually looking at um, you know, who are the people, the founders, who are the people that are there, more continuous evaluation and vetting of people. So I think those are all um, tied together. And um, you know, like I said, I think the, the, the lessons are solar winds are still to be determined, but, but clearly if you were in a big organization you should be looking at these um, systems a little bit closer. Well, and to your point, CMMC is just a foundational component, right? The supply chain risk management writ large is going to be a, the holistic view, right? Yes. CMMC is one of our tools, but you know, then we have the whole 889 uh, compliance concept, right? And there are other issues in uh, 1655, right? Where they talk in the NDAA talk about knowing who your software has been exposed to or who helped develop that software. You know, CMMC can't drive that part of it, but we'll have other tools that we're going to be able to overlay to start building that framework to protect ourselves because it is, they're coming at us from all sides. Be sure and I think the, the anticipatory and knowledge and wittingness of our, our contractors and our good partners is essential so that, you know, when one of our dip partners sees something strange going on and they can pick up the phone and let us know. So that's another thing the department's trying to do is expand our threat sharing a partnership with the dip, right? Mm -hmm. So right right now I think it's um restricted to those with classified contracts and they're trying to expand that to make it uh, more holistic across the board. Mm -hmm. And 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 one thing we can count on is CMMMC is going to bring accountability and that's the dirty word that nobody likes to use when these things happen. Okay. And, and so now we can actually see where that vulnerability occurred, where, where they failed in the safeguards and, and why, and, and perhaps they weren't on the level they were advertising ultimately. 
So this is really something that's going to be able to get those lessons learned faster and more targeted. And that's a good so, point, right? So we have this plan that, um, you know, so if a company has gotten their certification and they end up having a breach and have a loss of data, there'll be a forensic uh, review done. You know, we'll bring back in the assessor that did the assessment. We'll bring in a team to look to see what happened. So was it that the company was, they were compliant on the day they had their, and they let go of some of their practices and that's what caused the breach. Was it that the assessor didn't assess the right things, right? And then, okay, it, so does he need retraining or do, do we need to change something we did there? Or is this something outside the scope of what we could protect and we need to go back and relook at that model to tweak it to make sure we update it so it does meet that risk in the future? And all of these things are a learning process, right? I mean, you guys all know as you figure out how to block them one place, the kid in the basement next door has figured out how to hack back into your, your Facebook account on the other side, right? I mean, you know, all yeah. these different things they come up with and to stay out in front of it is, is a challenge. And that's why we all have to be ever vigilant to, to make sure that we do. And I think you said uh, the basic, uh, um, the CMMC is really, is going to be the basic enforcement mechanism. To me, what it's going to do beyond anything else is that it's going to increase awareness of cybersecurity in the C-suite, right? So it becomes a subject to talk about. Becomes, it becomes, it's going to be, and, and as Chris said, it's going to be existential to organizations because somebody's going to come check on you, right? And so as a result, you know, from that, lots of changes are going to occur. Uh, when organization, when leadership starts to understand cybersecurity as one of their pillars, in addition to budget and HR and so on, then then that becomes the start, the starting point. CMMC is going to be the starting point. There are going to have to be additional things that come in, and lots and lots of changes. Imagine, you know, uh, the, for example, um, you know, with blockchain, you know, new technologies, right? AI, blockchain, um, quantum you know, networking. I mean, it, it, things are going to come in that are going to change the face of cybersecurity. CMMC as that baseline is going to be there and, and, and be updated as a result of any changes to these kinds of things. Yeah, let me, um, I want to pivot here. And Chris, I think you brought it up a, a, a little while ago. And it's really on the topic of people, right? So, I, I mean, and I'm, it's a curious question. Are people included in this sort of supply chain, right? Like, I mean, how, how, if at all, do you believe that CMMC will actually improve our vetting and evaluation of employees going forward? And I'll open that to anybody who wants to take it. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the human factor side of this, um, from what they're doing at the AB and the leadership that Ben was saying they're bringing in to Stacy's team envisioning what's happening here and to the integrity of the assessors and the example we just gave, right? So, so really what we're talking about is building a, a new uh, cyber workforce for this, to, to, but it's going to be um, a cross-functional and discipline, right? Because the, the framework touches so many different areas. So really what we need to start thinking about is how do organizations, larger organizations start um, uh, building this training and learning internally. How does the university um, academies, I'm working with a, a startup right now, Lycian Academy, and they're starting to look at CMMMC as one of the training modules that they're gonna do. So we need to start bringing this type of conversation into uh, early thinking. And then we need to be giving people exposure around all of this. And then we have to put a high degree of trust in them and integrity in them and we also probably need to be assessing our assessors, right? So who's 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 watching the watch guards? So I, I really believe that um, you know there's so many insider activities that can occur with this model, from people getting paid off to people not having the right competencies to run these assessments. An example we just gave, and so that's where we're going to be looking at. That's a conversation we want to bring into the discussion. Um, and, and certainly that's why we've opted to go down the training route. You know, our, our vision is to have our trainers actually be practitioners in the field. And I think you really need to bring that real world experience in here, some of those stories, those battle stories uh, of what you should be looking at, how you should be dealing with these organizations as you move them forward to different maturity frameworks. 
Yeah, uh, we totally agree. And, you know, um, one of the things with our assessors, right? So we, we've made sure that each one of the assessors has a suitability determination. If you're going to do CMMC level one, you have to have a suitability determination of a level tier one. And then if you're going to do uh, CMMC level two or higher, you have to have a tier three suitability determination to make sure that we are getting the appropriate people. I do know that um, part of the model also has maturity concepts with insider threat and things of that nature as well. And, you know, we're working to look at the C3 PAOs and it is very important. That's one of the reasons why we implemented the ISO standards was to make sure that there was a quality aspect of these assessments and the people that are performing them. And the AB are going to be the ones that will be the oversight function for the C3 PAOs to ensure that that quality is there. And we all know that there's going to be some that are, are going to there's going to be issues, right? You never do anything that's perfect that, that you never have that one guy that's slick enough to get past you. But that's why we've got the forensics plan put in place that, okay, and, you know, and let's, let, let me tell you, if we end up having five companies that all are getting breached on a regular basis and hmm, they were all assessed by the same C3 PAO, then there's going to be a question that's going to come up where we're going to want to go find out what's going on. Not to not that we're going after somebody, but we need to understand why we're having the problems that we are right because. This is fundamental to our national security. And I think that's what people really have to understand not to be the paranoid person or make everybody paranoid, but. Our adversaries are not our friends. They don't. You know, they don't think twice about stealing our information and and using it for their own benefit and so as soon as we recognize that our that they're not our friends and they're people out there to get us and we need to protect ourselves to maintain our standard of living and our lifestyle to be able to continue we've got to be careful and we've got to be on top of this mm, right, that's a great yeah. point and, and joel just to finish i mean what we want to see with our clients is moving away from a check the box exercise with CMMMC and really getting into a culture of cybersecurity awareness and, and, and being vigilant. And I think CMMC, I, I always, I, I describe it almost like a competency model. This is the competency that we have to be to be saying that we're on this level. And so that language that's inside the document should also be the language we use when we talk about our systems and our processes and our tools. So really what we want to do is not have this be kind of got to do it, got to be compliant. And we really want to say this is something that can really help our organization, to your point, Stacey, our country be safer. And so that's bringing ball into the culture. And I think what you'll see is more rapid adoption if leadership are promoting that with their employees. If they're going to employ it as a cost or a headache or we weren't planning on doing this, now we've got to do this if we want to do federal contract, they're sending the, right, the wrong message to their people. The right message is around the mission and the purpose of why they're doing this and making sure that it takes deep root in the culture. Yeah. All right, well, I'd like to um, switch over now to a couple of questions. We do have two in the Q&A and, and uh, for any of the other audience members, please, if you have any other questions, send them in. Um, the first question comes from Colin uh, Bowers. He says, hopefully this is on topic. Uh, where do we stand on PAs using RPs for the pilot assessment? Is that I believe the pilot assessments will be a great training opportunity and a great way to start scale. Yeah, so we are, um, the PMO and the AB are having discussions about those requirements. They're not finalized. When they are, we will definitely advertise the makeup of the assessment teams. Anything okay. you wanna to add to that, Stacey? Or is it, that's pretty much it, right? Yeah, I, I, and I, you know, I'm not sure if the full question is like when when are companies going to be able to start getting assessed and we have the first C3 PAO that's getting ready to start their um, a third CMMC level three assessment. So each one of the C3 is going to have to be CMMC level three certified before they can start performing assessments because we have the assessment documentation and the information that they're getting from each one of the DIB partners as sensitive information. So we want to make sure that it's protected. 
Okay, great. So the next question we have is um, John Barker says there's a significant amount of confusion around CMMC still. He said this week uh, he's had 25, a 25 person organization request level five, another wanting turnkey solutions. Um, what can we do to simplify and then amplify the right message? Because expectations and perceptions right now are all over the map. So, uh, and I'm sorry to hear that. Um, we have done a lot of different briefings where we talk about, you know, our expectation is that the vast majority of the div is only ever going to have to be CMMC level one. About 20% will have to be CMMC level three and CMMC levels four and five are like the 0.03%, right? I mean, it's a very small uh, group that are handling the, the the very critical of technologies that we're, we're looking at. So from that perspective, you know, uh, it, it's interesting that, that they've got people all over the map trying to figure out what to do. Now, there that that's not to say that that you won't be able to use some of these um, security as a service type uh, products, right? Some of them will meet the the standards that we need to, to achieve. And I would highly suggest downloading the assessment guides and reading through those to see what is required and expected at what level. You know, we're not trying to be overly prescriptive to say you got to use, you know, you, you fail if you don't have this particular product. What we give you is uh, you need something that achieves this uh, standard, right? And you're free to choose wh wh whichever one you want as long as it meets that standard. So I think, you know, those assessments guides would be a great tool at this point in time to look through. And I do know that there are a bunch of different companies out there peddling uh, different tools to help get you prepared. Um, I am not in a position to uh, tell you which ones are good or bad because I haven't had the opportunity to look at them, nor would I it would be appropriate for me to do that. I think the AB is going to be doing some assessment of some of those tools to see how they line up with CMMC. So more to come on that, but you know, they're they're. I've been flapping my gums about this so much. I'm actually a little disappointed to hear that. <laughs> I know Stacey's on a, on a conference like this, like once or twice a day or something. It looks like it seems like at this point, um, you know, the, like anything else, any big thing, there's going to be confusion and lack of knowledge out there. Right. Our, our hope and our mission really is to improve upon that. Um, as the model matures, as we have, more specific information about how this is going to be run. I mean, the DOD has done a great job of doing pathfinders and, and, and you know, do, going, going through the test process, testing these things, learning from them, improving, then there's discussions. I mean, Stacy will tell you, and, and I'm involved in a lot of this stuff, but they, by, she's involved in it by a factor of 10. You know, it's, it is, incredible the level of discussions that are happening now. So the model is not mature. Look, we are building the plane while we're flying it, right? So there is a lot that still needs to come down. So yes, there is confusion. However, it is going at light speed. The people at the DOD are working as hard as they can. My God, I'm on calls sometimes at 8, 9 p.m. on a you know, conference call, you know, trying to get things done. So it is, a, once all of this is cleared, then the information campaign can really, really get started. So, so remember, we have five years. People need to start preparing. But one thing to keep in mind, if I could give one thing, um, is do not try to go for the highest level. Don't try to do the best you can just so you can get it, because that's going to increase your operational overhead, and you're not going to be able to recoup that. You need to go for the right level. How do you know the right level? Hire experts like Chris. The RPOs out there, consulting companies out there, so much information out there. Also look into Project Spectrum. They're there to help you. Um, you know, go look up Project Spectrum, DOD, CMMC support. They were there to help you for free figure out how to do this. And also work with your contracting officers. You know, they also are being trained right now. They may not know the level that they would want you to be at yet, but that's going to give them an onus to go find out. So they, you can find out what level you need to be at. 
Oh, you're you're on mute, Gerald. I would I made it almost the whole hour. Uh, that was great. So um, hey, I, I want to thank everybody. We're out of time. So um, certainly want to thank Stacy uh, Bustanik from the Office of the Secretary of Defense of Acquisition Sustainment, uh, Ben uh, Trubini from the CMMC um, Accreditation Body Board of Directors, and Chris uh, Vela Villasenor from uh, Teal Space. Uh, Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, help us kind of understand uh, a little bit more about CMMC. For everybody else, as a reminder, a copy of this recording will be made available on our website uh, and YouTube channel. So we encourage you to uh, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, once again, I'm Joel Charlotte, Cyberbytes Foundation. Uh, we hope you'll join us again next month uh, for another exciting uh, CM or uh, Cyberbytes networking event. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.